look beyond the day that you're living and you try to think of what those days and weeks and months might hold for you, sometimes we can be a little bit fearful because what we're thinking about is the unknown. And that's what fear is. Fear is, is anxiety or worry about something bad happening to us that's not yet known. And if you're fearful about something tonight, if you're fearful about what this year is going to bring, if you're fearful about how am I going to stay sober another day, or how am I going to deal with these particular people at my work, or how am I going to fill in the blank. If you're fearful tonight of anything or for any reason, the Lord has a word for you tonight from Isaiah 41. So look with me at the text. It says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we're so thankful that you invite us to the table of Christ. It is an invitation open to all, Lord, to come. Come to Jesus. Christ was crucified for sinners. And he will forgive and save anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. In humility and trust. And Lord, for those who do come to Christ, you adopt into your family as sons of God. And God, we know that your promises are sure and they are ones that we can build our entire lives upon. Tonight we look at a promise in scripture that you are with us. You are with your people. And because you're with us, you'll bless and protect and help and sustain. Therefore, we have no reason to fear. And all fear is cast out, Lord, because of your love for us. So help us, Lord, in 2022 to not walk in fear, but in the spirit that you've given your children, a spirit of power, love, and self-control. I pray this message tonight, Lord, would strengthen those who hear and would bless us in this year. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The primary command, if you look back at the text, is fear not. Fear not, or do not fear. Do not be afraid. That is what the Lord is speaking in this text. And it would be a little easier said than done if you know anything about the book of Isaiah. He is speaking to his contemporaries, but this particular passage is going to be most helpful to people beyond his generation. So he is prophesying that in about the next hundred years or so, Israel is going to go into captivity because of their disobedience. He knows this. The Lord has shown him. And when they go into captivity, another country is going to come in, namely the Babylonians, and they're going to absolutely destroy Jerusalem. They're going to destroy their city, they're going to kill many of their citizens, and they're going to take the rest who did not die or flee into captivity. And when they're in captivity, they're going to be away from their homes, they're going to be away from their land, they're going to be probably disconnected from family, they're going to be in situations that are very uncomfortable, and it's going to breed in them a lot of fear. And he knows this. And so as you think about that tonight, let me ask you a question. What do you fear the most? Like, what are your worst fears tonight? Because I know from just own personal experience, we become very afraid quite easily. We, we're easily filled with fear. I mean, just go home, turn on the news, and listen to them talk about the latest virus that's coming your way. Look how people respond. Or they talk about inflation and how the dollar is not going to go as far as it used to, and we become, we become afraid. We think about our future. We, how am I going to rebuild my life? How am I going to provide for my family? How am I going to do X, Y, and Z? If you're like me, I mean, my worst fear is what if something happens to my child? fills my heart with fear to think about these things. There's a thousand things that cause us to fear. I know I, when I was in my addiction, I was afraid to even open up a letter in the mail because I didn't want bad news. I was afraid to answer the phone. I was afraid every time I heard a door or car door shut. Look out the window, who is that? I was afraid anytime I saw a white car driving behind me, maybe it was a cop. I lived my life full of fear and so do many of you. You don't realize, we don't realize how much fear plays a role in our lives. Sometimes I'll wake up and I'll be thinking about the day ahead of me and all the tasks I had to do and I'll start to get anxiety. That's fear. And I have to stop 
And I have to realize what's going on. And I have to give those fears to the Lord. Some of you are sitting here and some of you men are prideful. I'm not afraid of anything. You would be shocked to see how much fear you have in your life if you were truly honest. Fear is a true enemy in our lives. And listen, fear is a thief. Because fear will steal steal your joy and your peace if you let it. And so tonight I pray that this message helps you because here's what the Lord is saying. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. Why? Not because we're strong. Not because we have it all together. But why? He says, because I'm your God. I will be with you. I will help you. I will sustain you. You see, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. And so the reason I want to just kick off 2022 with you with the message on do not fear is as you look into this year coming, my hope and my prayer is that you would just live moment by moment trusting Christ. Do not fear. Don't project into the future. The worst thing that somebody in recovery can do is dwell upon the past or project into the future. Can I get an amen? We need to live in the present. We need to live right here, right now, trusting in Christ today. Now, as I get into this, as I said, the main command is do not fear. And the question is, what is fear? What is fear? I mean, we use that word all the time. We take for granted what it means. But what does it mean to be afraid? And I think a simple definition is helpful. And fear, I think, first of all, is an emotion. It's a feeling, right? But specifically, it's, it's when you get anxiety or feel worrisome that something bad is going to happen to you. Now, it hasn't happened yet, and most of the time our fears are never realized, are they? Most of the times our fears don't even come true. We, we're afraid of stuff that never even comes to fruition, but that's what fear is. Fear is being afraid of the future. It's being afraid of the unknown, specifically that something bad is going to happen. So, for example, I might be afraid that I'm going to get sick, go out in public, and I'm going to get coronavirus or Omicron or whatever the heck the next one is. I'm afraid that I'm not going to have enough money to pay my bills. I'm afraid that my loved ones are going to be injured or hurt or ill. I'm afraid that I can't stay sober. I'm afraid that fill in the blank. It's, it's always a fear of the unknown, and that unknown is something that bad is going to happen to you. That's what fear is. Now, that kind of fear is sinful. When you're afraid of something that is not yet happened, has not yet happened, that may never happen, and you're afraid, that's sinful. Now, contrast that and compare that with the fact that sometimes we can be cautious, and that's not being sinful. I just want to make this very clear. Like, so, for example, this past, what was it, Thursday, I believe, I was supposed to to do a funeral here at the church. I was all set to do this funeral, and I felt like I might be having some symptoms that could be covid having some weird taste in my mouth, just some feelings in my body. So I'm like, you know, I've been feeling this for a few days, and I was thinking, okay, I'm getting ready to go to this funeral, be around a lot of older people. I didn't want to get anybody sick. So I had somebody else step in for me to do the funeral, and I went and got a test for COVID. Thank God it was negative, and I feel fine. But that wasn't me being sinfully afraid. I wasn't being fearful because I was fearful of the unknown. I was being cautious. So it's, it's different if you're being cautious and trying to plan and protect yourself Versus I'm afraid that I'm going to lose my place to live because I can't pay my bills because I'm going to relapse again. When you're still sober and working and paying your bills or whatever it may be. When the Lord tells us to not be afraid, he's saying stop letting the fear of the unknown control you. Stop letting your circumstances fill you with fear and trust in me. Trust in me. When we allow fear to allow us to prevent us from trusting God, that is sin, and that's what's in view here. And so here's what we have to do to start with before I get into the text. Let me give you some very simple steps to overcome fear, okay? When you get up in the morning and you feel anxiety and worry, here's what you need to do. Just work the first three steps of recovery. Number one, you admit that you're powerless over your fear. If you will recognize that you're afraid and you say, I can't control whatever it is I think is going to happen to me, Because that's the future. I have no control over the future. And really these things are out of my control anyway. I'm completely powerless. But who does have power? God does. 
Believe that God is in control of your future. That's step two, isn't it? Step one is you are powerless. Step two is believe. Believe that Christ controls your future. And then step three is surrendering your circumstances to him. Lord, I can't, but I know you can. I I can't control what comes my way today, but I know you are in control, and I hand over everything to you, and, and the Lord will give you peace. The Lord will give you peace. And so tonight, I want to look at this text with you, and I want to give you five reasons from this passage of Scripture why you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. If you trust in Christ moment by moment and believe the promises of God, you don't need to be afraid. And I'll give you five reasons. Number one, fear not because God is with you. Look back at the text with me. He says, fear not for I, the Lord, am with you. For those of you who have put your trust in Christ, God is your Father, Christ is your Savior, and the Bible says that I am with you. Jesus' promise is to be with his people, and that's why we don't need to be afraid. And here's what you got to understand. When God says, I'll be with you, there's a sense in which God is always with you, whether you're a believer or unbeliever, because God is omnipresent, meaning he is in all places at all times. God is everywhere, so there's no place that you can go that God is not. But when he says, I am with you, it's more than just God's omnipresence. It's more than just his presence that fills all of time and space and eternity. This is his presence to bless you. This is his presence to protect you. This is something that only the believer has. The non-Christian does not have this. This is his presence to bless his people. Listen to what he says in chapter 43, verse 2. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He's saying, when you go through troublesome circumstances, I will be there. I mean, if God is present with you and doesn't help you, then he's not really fulfilling his promise here, is he? I mean, imagine if your house is getting robbed, you call the police. The police show up and they just watch the thieves walk out of your house with all your goods. Their presence didn't really help you much, did it? No, their presence is there to protect you. Their presence is there not just to be with you, but to bless you. And that's what God is saying. I'll be with you to protect and to bless and to provide. And this God who is with you guys, if you knew this God with greater depths than you do now, we would never be afraid again. This is the God who says, I can hold the oceans in the palm of my hand. He has measured out all the waters in the palm of his hand. This is a God who says, I measure the cosmos with the span of my hand. The span of his hand being his thumb to his pinky. God says, I can measure the entire universe. He's talking about his greatness and his power. He's also wise. This God is infinitely wise, the one who is with you. In Isaiah 40, 11, he says, Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Who has shown him counsel? Whom did he consult and whom did he made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? This God is not only great and powerful, he is wise, infinitely knowledgeable. And he's also kind. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather his lambs in his arms, he'll carry them in his bosom, and he'll gently lead those who are with young. Listen, if you trust Christ and God is your father, you have an infinitely great, wise, and kind God who says, I will be with you in 2022. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what happens to you, I will be with you. Number two, fear not because God is your God. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, and notice I say if you have trusted Jesus Christ, there's a a condition here. We'll go back to that at the end. Because these promises are only for Christians. For the non-Christian, these promises don't apply. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But he says, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be dismayed. For I am your God. I belong to you. Remember when I was a kid, I, I grew up watching Michael Jordan. I grew up, anybody collect baseball cards, basketball cards? I used to collect tons of them. And I still have few, not many, but there was one card I remember, it was at this place called Umpire's Choice, and I wanted, I wanted this basketball card so bad, I went into this place probably half a dozen times with my buddy and looked at this, it was a Michael Jordan's gold card, I thought this thing was worth thousands of dollars, turned out it was like 30 bucks, 
But, uh, you know, I, I thought this thing was just priceless. And finally, I asked my dad. I said, Dad, will you buy this for me? And it was like 30 bucks. I was like, sure, I'll get it. And I just couldn't believe it. Because this card that I, I admired from a distance all of a sudden became mine. It was my possession. It belonged to me. And that's what God is saying here. Do you believe this? He's not only saying, do you belong to me? He's saying, I belong to you. I am your God. Listen, God has so committed himself to his people that he will not enter into eternity without you. He is so committed that he will make good on his promises to keep you and sustain you and to be with you, and he cannot break his word. God cannot go back on his word because God does not lie. And here's the good news. You all belong to God by virtue of creation. You have been created by God and for God, whether or not you're a Christian. But if you're in Christ, you are doubly owned and doubly belong to God because of redemption. He has purchased you back from sin and death and Satan. And God in Christ has become your God and you belong to him. So he's saying, because of that, don't be afraid. You're mine. I will care for you. And listen, does that mean that our lives will never have bad circumstances? No. But it means that even those bad circumstances, God is in control of and working for your good. Number three, fear not because God will strengthen you. He will strengthen you. He says, for I am your God, I will strengthen you. Now, does this mean physically? He'll he'll strengthen your body physically? Maybe. Maybe. And God does at times. But I think primarily what he's saying here is I will strengthen you spiritually. Remember, he's talking about not being afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? I'll strengthen you. And so what that probably means is I'll strengthen you in your inner man. I'll give you inner peace. I'll give you a calm. You'll be like that person in the bottom of the ship in the midst of the sea and the waves and the winds are crashing against the boat and it's turned inside and it looks like it's going to capsize and you're down in that little bedroom area fast asleep. And that's the same thing with the Christian. There's all kinds of crazy circumstances that surround our lives. And we're not always going through pleasant seasons, but there's a a deep inner peace that always resides in us no matter what. There's always this this deep-seated hope that we have because of Christ. I mean, even if our flesh wastes away through illness, even if our loved ones perish before our eyes, even if the bottom falls out completely. If you have Christ, there, there's something deep down inside of you. There's an anchor for your soul. There's someone holding on to you, giving you hope and optimism for the future because of his promises. If you ever read the Gospels after Jesus was crucified, raised from the dead, the the disciples are terrified because they're afraid that the Jews are going to do the same to them, so they locked themselves in a room. They're terrified and afraid. They thought maybe they would have the same fate as Jesus, and then all of a sudden Jesus appears to them and says, peace be with you. And all their fears were calm. Why? Because his presence was with them. His presence was with them. And when you come to know Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you and changes you and gives you that power and inner peace. Number four, he says, fear not because God will help you. Look back at the text. He says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I have this text on two portraits in my house. They're split up half and half. I read it all the time. I look at this passage of scripture because it helps me. It reminds me. And to think that, that God is with me to help me. And listen, God not only helps us spiritually, he provides for all of our needs. I remember when we were in quarantine, we, we were worried because there, I was living in Indiana at the time. There were food shortages. I mean, you'd go to, go to the grocery store and they'd be out of everything. And I didn't get as worried as my wife did because my wife was always concerned about putting food on the table for my family, and there were times when we couldn't find any meat anywhere. I remember one time we went to um, this one particular town, and I took a, a route home that I normally don't take, and we came across this butcher that we'd never seen before. And we just happened to stop in there, and they had plenty of meat, and God provided. Now, some of 
you might be thinking, well, that was a coincidence or just sheer luck. I don't see it that way. I see when the Lord says, I will help you, I see him saying, I will provide everything you need. I'll provide everything you need for the coming year. I'll provide everything you need for this moment. That's what God wants to do. He wants, he wants to help you. That's why Jesus said, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. He will help you. We need to trust his promises. Number five, fear not because God will sustain you. He says, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is a God who, in the midst of trial, will walk with you and sustain you. And in those moments, when you feel like I'm barely holding on, you ever felt like that? I'm barely getting through the day. I'm barely going to make it. When you feel like I'm doing everything I can to connect with God, I'm doing everything I can to pray and stay in his will, do you realize those are the moments where he's holding you? Like we feel like we're doing everything we can to hold on to Christ, but it's actually Christ holding on to us. I, I shared this story the other day. I often will walk into to places with my daughter, whether it be church or a building or a store, or whatever. And when we go through parking lots, I always make her hold my hand. She's six years old. I never know if she's going to dash off or what she's going to do. And I can always feel her trying to get out of my grasp. I can always feel her trying to slip away from my hand, but she never does. And it's not because of her hold on me. It's because of my hold on her. I will not let her go. And that's what God promises to you. And so those days when you feel like I'm doing everything I can to hold on to the Lord, it's him holding on to you. It is not your grasp upon the hand of Christ that keeps you. It's the hand of Christ that sustains his people. He'll give you that support. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, number one, I just want you to know you're here. So welcome here. Glad you're here. Maybe Christianity is not for you, or you you really haven't made a decision on that yet. I just want you to know that none of these promises apply to you if you don't know Christ. And all this talk about fearing the future and, and fearing the unknown, you don't need to worry about any of that because there's something greater you need to fear, and that's the wrath of God. Don't worry about earthly fears. You need to fear the one whom you've offended with your sin. Fear him. Because there's nothing in this world that will even compare to his justice and his judgment. And he will do what's right. He knows your sin. And the judge of all the earth always meets out justice. And the good news for you tonight is that you still draw breath and you still have life which means you have this moment to repent of your sins and trust in Christ for forgiveness. The God who made you, the God who will pour out his justice upon you, also offers you forgiveness and salvation through Jesus. This is what the cross is all about. The cross of Jesus Christ is God's offer of redemption. This is why Christ died. Christ died upon the cross and he didn't just die a human death. Jesus on that cross took the sins of everyone who will ever trust in him upon himself. He who knew no sin, Christ, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God and God the Father poured out his wrath upon his son. God crushed his son for sinners so that all who believe upon Jesus don't have to be judged because Christ was judged in our place. He died for us. And the Bible also says that we died in him, that when Christ died, we were actually there and our lives died. This is why we can say, I can say, I'm not the man that I once was. That old man is dead. He died in Christ. He was crucified in Christ. He was judged in Christ. My sins were judged in Christ. 
And if you're here tonight and you haven't trusted Christ, then you will have to have your sins dealt upon you. And God's justice against your sins upon you. If you don't turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. And you can do that right now. You can forsake all of your sins, all of your old life, all of your old ways and say, I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. I want to throw myself on the mercies of Christ. And that's the only way you can be right with God. Do not do not think that you can try to be better and do better. Sin has ruined you. Sin has completely ruined us. And the only hope that we can have a fresh start is in Christ. The only way we can ever hope to have righteousness and right standing before God is Christ. Christ is the one who is righteous and good and holy. And in him, you can have all of those benefits. But if you try to obtain those things outside of Christ, there is no hope for you. There is only hope in Jesus. And Jesus is all you need. You don't need Jesus plus a baptism. You don't need Jesus plus good works or Jesus plus sobriety. You need Jesus alone. He is all you need. And so my prayer is twofold. One, if you're here today and you have trusted Christ, praise God for that. Trust in him every single day of 2022. Cast all your fears, all your anxieties on him. And if you're here tonight and you're outside of Christ, you, you are not a Christian, tonight's the night to be saved. So let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads.